Nasir. As you see my profile here, I'm now working at King Saud Medical City and King Saud Family Medicine Academy as a trainer and a clinician also. Uh, I have a very vast experience, national and international. And uh, I'm really very uh, grateful to the organizers of this activity to give me the opportunity to be with you this evening and to share some of my little experience with your vast experience combined together. And I think we should come out with a conclusion which is useful to everybody regard, regarding such a very important topic. So this is my objective of the presentation. Uh, so my objective of this evening I wish to achieve is there are very few objectives and I think I'm going to achieve them in within 40 minutes hopefully, depending on the speed and the velocity we go with our interactive session. So I want to revisit actually an important old topic because prevention is one of the oldest topics as we know all. So epidemiology is old and epidemiology is linked. If you go to any book of epidemiology, you find anything has to do with health promotion, anything has, because the study of disease, we are going to talk about diseases today. So the second thing is to provide actually the evidence-based information regarding different preventive tools. I was thinking of how I could present uh, this, really this uh, presentation. And I, pre I just, came to a conclusion that I think I should have some evidence-based information to some of our attendees this evening. Lastly, but not the least, is to, re to remind some of us, one of my objectives is to remind some of us what we should know, what we know, what we should know, and more importantly, what we should do to our population at large and their health maintainers at all times. So this is by large my objectives and aims of this evening discussion. Hopefully I will achieve them and any extra or uh, extrapolating beyond this, I think should be useful in relation to the topic. So now I just want somebody, I don't know how we share, just to define to me, what do you understand by the term chronic diseases? Chronic diseases. How oh, chronic disease, what is a chronic disease? Um, everyone, you can unmute yourselves and answer Dr. Abdurrahman. Uh, chronic disease, doctor, uh, that means uh, treatable disease, not curable. So lifelong uh, diseases. Okay, lifelong. It could be curative somewhat. Yeah, I agree with you, but definitely is a lifelong. So one of the main features is a lifelong disease, and that is why they call chronic. Okay, I agree with you. Any other feature in common to these diseases? Anything common among them? Yeah, I remember two diseases. Just contrast them and tell me what, what really brings them together in one group or in one bag. Victor Safe. Anybody? Okay. Re recurrent. Okay. 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 Or the symptoms can be recurrent. Some of them, they have a very long asymptomatic period. I agree with you definitely. Any other addition, information, additional information in relation? We are defining for people who has just joined us in, just we are trying to go to lay the ground for the discussion, what is chronic disease? So any, I just want somebody to wrap it up in one or three lines. Okay. So can somebody give me an example of the chronic diseases he knows or we are following? Diabetes, mellitus. Okay, it definitely on the top of the list. Thanks. What else? Uh, hypertension. Yes, that's true. What else? Um, hypothyroidism. All hypothyroidism. Right. Okay. Uh, asthma. Okay, bronchial asthma, definitely. That's good. Any other things around? Command, there are many, I agree. Okay. Has complications, if not controlled, I like. Has complication, not controlled, this is a good thing. 
sickle cell disease and thalassemia, definitely. So we have two ways of saying it. Either we categorize it together. We say, for example, metabolic disease, endocrine diseases, cardiovascular diseases. I think it should be, be on the top of the list because now we are going to see when we talk about the mortality and morbidity. Okay, let me see my first definition I put for you here, but this is a very good contribution and a good start. Thanks a lot. Okay, now. So, there are many definitions. Provided you gave the, the main meaning, it is okay. In any way you frame it, you must understand the really the core meaning of the whole issue. So chronic diseases are heterogeneous group of disorders, but many share underlying causes are risk factors. And this is a very important fact, it's an issue, because we are going to talk this evening about causes and risk factors, because cause, risk, epidemiology, and so on. Now, these diseases require ongoing medical care. Regarding the duration, they call them chronic, but you know all that, for example, when did the diabetes start? We all know. So when did the diabetes start? What is, when will you call a diabetic patient he has a chronic diabetes? Anybody? Or hypertension? But we know hepatitis six months, for example. And we know some diseases one year, then before you say it is a chronic infection. So what, what is it there and for diabetes and hypertension, for example, or this lipidemia? So here away the issue, that's why I put duration question mark. You see, for diabetes, you all know that for type two diabetes, especially that these patients have the ailment and the damage, unfortunately, even before they present. And this is very important. And you know, this is, we know it, and a very, very important topic coming up now. Okay, what we call the legacy effect. I'm sure you read about it. And I mentioned it in many of our discussions regarding this chronic disease. So the legacy effect that the disease will start even before it presents. So the memory, we call it metabolic memory or the legacy. So usually these diseases or some of them may limit the activity of daily living of the patient who is afflicted with it. Now the new name coming up as our meeting in the Ministry of Health here in Riyadh, we call them non-communicable diseases. Taban here this word, well, some people may argue it has some genetic communicable way of saying it. But what we mean by non-communicable diseases, for example, is not like brucella or malaria, for example, or hepatitis. So that is the meaning. So the group is, has another name in addition to chronic diseases is non-communicable diseases. So many are linked to lifestyle factors. And we may have to, be, to blame us, our, our communities for changing their behavior, being sedentary, eating unhealthy foods and so on. So personally, I believe the society is responsible and it is a system problem where we have this problem. And you see this in the next slide that it is the society who really determine our behavior since we are very young. How? Promotion of tobacco, which is still going on in some many countries in the globe. Salt hidden in processed foods, Saudi Arabia. High sugar in many drinks is still going on, although there are some restrictions, increased tax in Saudi Arabia. High saturated and trans fats, still yani, a lot. Then the being urbanization or getting urban, transferring people from rural areas to urban life. So this is some of the factors actually of this issue of regarding chronic diseases. So I just wanted to sensitize you that the issue is not only the behavior, the responsibility is not only the patient, but it is the community and the community leaders and the healthcare leaders and the healthcare providers, not least. So please remember, so it's a multi-agent form of responsibility. I hope this is clear, just to lay the ground for this discussion. Now, having said that, this is a societal factors. Shall we talk about the mortality and morbidity? We all know without any dispute that cardiovascular disease are the top diseases which are causing the highest morbidity and mortality all over the globe. So you talk of hypertension, what is the commonest cause of this in hypertension? Cardiovascular. What is the commonest cause in diabetes, which is a cardiovascular equivalent, I believe, is cardiovascular again. So most, even the malignancies, 
They are talking now, the main cause is cardiovascular cause. So you look at many of the chronic diseases, at the end, the cause of the mortality and morbidity, it has to do in one way or the other to the cardiovascular link. So that's why I put the cardiovascular, unfortunately, like most of the diseases, they don't have symptoms or obvious signs of any vascular diseases. Somebody can just come to the ER with CVA, which is unfortunate, or with myocardial infarction, and he will have no single symptom one hour before. So they have an ongoing arterial sclerosis, which you know, which is going over the time, starting even from the womb. When the child inside his mother's womb, so that's why some of the new studies are following these kids from infancy. So, and increase the risk of vascular events, we know there are say many, and I don't believe in this, a lot of numbers, but 40% of the mortality globally is contributed to these problems. So that's why I'm giving it a priority. That's why I'm bringing the evidence for these diseases. That's why my concentration this evening is on this topic. Now, the second group we all know are the malignancies. And I'm going to also mention three, four, five slides about them. Chronic respiratory diseases are known. This list is, can never be yani, inclusive. There are so many, many topics we have not mentioned. And I will show you my second slide that things we always ignore, even our planning and so on, that we forget about these diseases and they're very important and they contribute a lot to the mortality and morbidity, e.g. injuries and accidents multiple sclerosis, dementia, mental illnesses, osteoarthritis, chronic kidney diseases, glaucoma, occupational diseases, geriatric gains, including falls, incontinence, and so on, dental problems, thyroid, just somebody mentioned it. I didn't even put it here. You see, we always miss many of these diseases. So what I can call that it is something always with us in the clinic. Daily, we see four, five, six, seven diseases rather than diabetes and hypertension. So this is why I put this slide that chronic diseases, there are many are considered for maybe logistic reasons, financial reasons, economic reasons, organizational reasons, we don't know. But we always don't remember most of them, these diseases. Okay, now let us take, I'll just, my let's go back. Yes, I want somebody to tell me what does he understand by the term health promotion? Health promotion, anybody? Anybody can define to me the term health promotion? Anybody writing anything? Nobody yet. It's, it's the allowing of Okay, can you, can you just raise your voice, please? Part of primary prevention, doctor. Okay, okay. Yeah, well, primary no. prevention is, palm, is very excellent. This is part of the health promotion. But what is health promotion? Bring it to me totally together in one word. Or one sentence, I mean. Yeah, okay, primary prevention is part of health promotion. But is it the only activity we do? And we call it health promotion? So if I vaccinate my kids in the environment and give them flu and COVID vaccine in my primary health care, it means I have done health promotion to my population or there are some other activities. And I'm sure you know there are many other activities. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Health promotion includes many things, right from the nutritional modification, environmental modification, immunization. Very so good. So simply in the COVID process, application of the mask and all these things comes under the health promotional measures. Very good. That's why they said to maintain and improve health. That's very excellent. And what you said is definitely right. But we have to remember, doctor, if you have a patient who is coming for upper respiratory tract infection and you check his blood pressure and it happens many times and you got the BP very high. So there is another activity going in here. We know is secondary prevention. You know it. Since primary prevention, I'm going to give so many examples of primary prevention because many people believe and residents that it is only vaccination and so on, but there are many activities. So this is very excellent. Again, to complete the whole thing is to think of tertiary prevention, which we have to say it, and it's very unfortunate if most of our activities are tertiary prevention, as we define it now. So I want somebody to tell me what is the difference, what is second primary prevention, what is secondary prevention, and what is tertiary prevention? Just three people, yani, if it is primary convenient. Primary prevention is action or intervention is taken prior to the onset of the disease. 
Very good. Excellent. So you anticipate. We call it the state of anticipation. So I vaccinate my kids against rotavirus, against, for example, hepatitis B and so on, because I'm doing anticipation care. Excellent. Excellent. And it is usually a population-based approach. Excellent. So what is secondary prevention, which is a whole discussion today? <laughs> secondary prevention. Early detection. Of yeah, disease. early detection of disease. Excellent. Excellent. Pre-symptomatic. Yes, go ahead, sir. In a, uh, the early detection of a disease in a symptomatic stage. Okay. So what is tertiary prevention? Prevent complication or decrease yeah, the complication. Prevent complication. Very unfortunate state. I hate saying it always to my resident because this is, it presents our failure as family physicians and primary healthcare physicians. So if in a community I have a lot of complicated cases, a lot of, for example, amputated legs, blind patients, I think this is unfortunate. We will present our failure as a system, as a healthcare providers. So we don't pray to have such very, I mean, debilitating, uh, advanced stages of diseases. Okay, now let us concentrate. I'm, the definition of primary is very clear and we are going to give the examples, but I want to talk more about secondary prevention because this is the main activities, the 2030 uh, mission and vision talking about, and we have been doing it for years now. So I want somebody to go more to give me the word which the epidemiologists use which is just interchangeably used for secondary infection. What is that word? And it gives the same meaning. So you said pre-symptomatic detection or detection of diseases at early stage. So what is this activity called? One word. One. Now, now I was screening. Screening is already in the screen here for me. Excellent. Screening. So these screening programs are going in Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries and the whole globe. Everybody is screening patients, hypertension, diabetes, pre-diabetes, everybody is going. So we know, because of the time we're not talking, but just to remind you, you know, if you, th that each disease has to satisfy a certain criteria to go for the screening. Yeah, and we know what are the commonest three diseases we are screening in Saudi Arabia or four diseases, let us say. So what are the diseases we are screening as primary care physicians and we have guidelines for them, what are they? Breast yeah, cancer. Breast cancer, number one, yes. And this means now when we come to the criteria, you will get this. Yes, breast cancer, what else? DM. DM, excellent. I just want two more examples, what else? Colon cancer also. Colon cancer, actually. And this is what is going in this country. Excellent programs. Okay. Yeah. Asthma. Asthma. Okay. But asthma, we don't screen as such, but asthma, yani, we, yani, it can be. But I want a more active screening you are doing in your primary care. What of checking weight of patients? This epidemia. Blood pressure. That's in the commonest screening program, in addition to breast and colon cancer and malignancies, is hypertension. Screening for asymptomatic silent killer. Very important hypertension as a screening. So from what you said and what we said together, as hypertension is there, dyslipidemia is there, depression is there. All this we screen for them and there is always many tools to screen them with and which are important, definitely. So these diseases you mentioned and others, and I can see on the screen, as I said, hypertension. These diseases are common, one. So what are the features? for a disease to be included for a screening program so that we take the time of our healthcare providers, the money and everything is directed towards, for example, the screening of the breast cancer, for example, because it is common, it is really has a stage, the most important point and we must get a stage where we can intervene to reduce the mortality or uh, morbidity. Otherwise we shouldn't do the screening. If it is not at a stage where I can do something in other ways, I must have what I can do for the patient when I discover he has the problem early. For example, hypertension. So do I have the health educator who can educate him about his lifestyle, for example? Do I have the drugs available? Do I have the planning for follow-up of this patient and so on? So you must only, not only discover the disease, but you must have early plan, which tells us that when this 
patient is discovered to have, for example, diabetes, this is what is going to happen to him. So this is very important. Yes, I know there is Wilson criteria. I'm just reminding you, and there is modified Wilson criteria, and the features goes up to 15 features. So screening has this, this is number one. And what are the other features you look for when you are screening a patient regarding the test? Let us say the test, for example, for breast test. And there are changes, as you know, updated ones. For example, self-examination is no more evidence-based and they don't advise for it. Must example. So what, what are the features you need in a test? So what are the criteria? What are the parameters of a diagnostic test when you are doing it? Even if it is a blood pressure measurement, if it is a malignancy screening, looking for markers, malignancy markers, we all know them. So what do you think other features we should have before we start the screening? Sensitivity and uh, specificity of the test. Very good, very good, very good, excellent. So the test, you should know the sensitivity in comparison to the specificity. What else? What is the most important thing in relation to a diagnostic test? If you talk about diagnostic test, so what is the most important thing? The criteria for the screening. Yeah. yeah, the criteria for the screening, I mentioned Wilson and the modified Wilson, which I know all of you, you know it. But the test, regarding the test, and this is where evidence base comes in. You see? So a test should be has certain criteria, positive predictive value. What is the positive predictive value? It means, what is the possibility to detect to me a patient, the mammogram will detect to me a patient who is having an early breast changes, for example. And what is the negative predictive value? If the patient doesn't have the disease, what is the percentage that this disease really will not be seen? So I will not get any false positive there. And contrary in the other one. Then the pretest odds. What are the pretest odds of this test? What is the post-test odds? What is the pretest probability, which is the prevalence? And what is the post-test probability? So there are many features also to the test. And this is evidence-based, very important. Okay, now I'm very happy that the coming slide, you already said them. I will just tell you the reframing of these definitions. Okay, so now we move to primary prevention. Primary prevention, okay. So generally prevention, by the way, it is action to stop something from happening. So we prevent disease or injury before it ever occurs, as you rightly said, some of you. Prevent exposure to hazards that cause diseases. Altering, this is very important. Altering unhealthy or unsafe behaviors and increasing resistance to disease should exposure occur. And this is the vaccination. Come on, it includes prophylaxis, as you will see very soon in the examples that I have given. Now, secondary prevention, I have two slides summarizing everything. Regular health checks, we need to remember this, are invaluable because many diseases are detected during such process. When they are in their early stages, and we talked about that. It is also known that some diseases are without symptoms, asymptomatic. That's why I said pre-symptomatic detection until they reach an advanced stage when unfortunately irreparable damage must have been done to the person. So to avoid this, family physician need to read and adopt an updated recommendation regarding early detection of chronic diseases. And every day we are getting new guidelines, new guidelines, new guidelines. So secondary prevention again, that detecting and treating diseases or injury as soon as possible, as much as I can. And this is time, the natural history of the disease. It has to do with many factors. So our objective should be to halt or slow the progress of this disease. Encourage personal strategies to prevent any damage or injury or re-injury to the person or recurrence. So what it means in secondary prevention, we need to implement programs to return people to their original health function, if we can, yani, is a difficult thing, but let us hope, and function to prevent long-term problems and complications and taking us to tertiary prevention. We don't want to reach that stage. So it's a balance actually between primary and secondary. I always don't talk much about tertiary because I don't want to reach the tertiary stage in our community or the percentage which complication should be very low in the number. It is an early intervention that reduces the prevalence of a specific problem. So this is a very good 
statement talking about secondary prevention. It is an early intervention that reduced the prevalence of a specific problem. Okay, so now, before we give the tertiary prevention, I'm going also to look at primary, secondary, and tertiary together in some presentations very soon. You will see very soon. Okay, let us talk about simply tertiary prevention. Tertiary prevention is treatment designed to improve the quality of life and reduce the symptoms after a disease or a disorder has developed. So this is, does not reduce the incidence and prevalence. So, sorry, Annie, although some of you might be very fast readers, I want somebody to define to me what is an incidence of a disease and what is the prevalence of a disease? Anybody? Incidence is occurrence of the new cases in a yes, given population. These are the new time. cases. So what of prevalence, doctor? A number of existing cases in the given population. Yeah, existing. The word you brought, I'm very happy. That's why I bring my slide immediately. See this uh, diagram I'm putting here. I got it from the net. Very useful diagram. So the incidence, the number of new cases. The prevalence, the existing number. So proportion, epidemiologist like numbers, percentage. So it's proportion of people who have a disorder during a particular time period. This is the prevalence. And proportion of rate of persons who develop the disorder, the new cases. So please have a look at this diagram. It's a very useful diagram. Before I show you more diagrams to wrap up health promotion and the three types of uh, prevention, including what we talk about now, the new papers about primordial, uh, prevention. Again, this is just a diagram, a, diagram, a diagram representation of what is the whole thing we are discussing. Okay, avoiding development of diseases, early detection, reduce complications. So it's the same thing, one by large. Again, the same diagram, but in another way, adding primoidal form. They talk now of primoidal which is very difficult, but some good books, I looked at and papers, they are dividing that vaccination and so on. This is more of a premoroidal. And if you look at the kids from their young, even when the child is in infancy, it should be something like that. But I personally, I don't feel any dichotomy or any, I cannot feel the blurred line between primary and promoidal, whatever the epidemiologists say, unfortunately. So I still believe it's primary, secondary, and tertiary. But well, they are saying, when I checked that some papers, they said in PubMed, they said this is applied to hypertension, for example, and some of the metabolic diseases, this epidemia, and so on. So it's maintaining health. Well, OK, avoiding the risk. Reduce and eliminate almost the same primary. Minimize severity by detecting early. And complications, tertiary. This is just by, by large. Yeah. I'm just trying to put it by large. But, I just tried to bring two slides in summarizing two main conferences, the Third Heart International Conference and the Ottawa defining the health promotion. So this is what this conference has said, that cardiovascular risk prevention had to be encouraged throughout the life spine of a human being. And we should have availability of cheap, healthy food. We should promote desirable eating habits in our kids since they are young, even before the school age, I believe to ensure they have favorable risk profile when they grow older. This statement is very important, I will read it again. Promoting desirable eating habit and other exercise and so on in school age to ensure they have favorable risk profile when they grow. And this is the issue. You ha I have a patient in my room this afternoon, his age is 54. He had a lot of risk factors coming inside into his heart. So you see, if we do that, at least, Yes, he's a male, I can't change that. He's coming from so-so area, I can't change that, all right. But favorable risk profile for the modifiable risk factors. And I'm sure you know them, the modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So many metabolic things and so on. So we need to have a favorable risk profile when we grow older. That is what is the essence of the whole discussion, okay? Now, what of the Ottawa defining health promotion? Now bringing the administration in. And this is in third international also, but the Ottawa charter divided, defined the health promotion action in the following ways. Build healthy public policy, create supportive environments, strengthen community action. This is very important, the participation. Develop personal skills, 
and reorient your health services. So many people ask me, what is this reorientation of health services? So can somebody tell me what is, give me an example of reorientation of the health services. Anybody? Reorientation of the health services. Anybody? Is it prioritization? You prioritize things in your care that I have diabetes more, so I need to have more machines for diabetes, not to have EMG machine in my clinic. I don't know. To have an ophthalmologist, but not a neurologist in my clinic. I don't know. So what is the orientation of the health services? Salam, Dr. Nasih, how are you? Allah, how are you? I hope you, you hear me. I hear you very well. Now, how, is it, how is the discussion? How is the discussion going on? والله انت دائما يو ار ذا توب يو ار ذا بيست اصلا ما تفرق بانك انت اللي حتقدم يديك العافيه الله يسعدك ري اورينت هيلث سيرفيس اي ثينك ذا مينينغ اوف انستيد اوف بوتينغ هيوج اماونت اون كيوراتيف وي انستيد اوف ات وي هاف تو بوت اون بريفنشن انستيد اوف ويتينغ ذا بيشنت تو كم تو اس وي هاف تو بي برو اكتيف اند ستارت registries, trust, uh, to go to the patient, risk factor, go to social Excellent. environment, and these Excellent. things. Excellent. 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 And this is what we want in our primary healthcare physicians now. If you see a patient, please remember risk factors, risk factors, risk screen for risk factors, so that you may discover many you can modify. Excellent, Adictora. Thank you very much, really. So somebody asked me also, what is this reorientation again? Can you give me a typical example? Anybody? Okay, and I'm always يعني, criticizing people who write too many and too much antibiotic in our primary health care centers. So I always tell them, I, I delivered one lecture. I remember I am always involved in diabetes uh, conferences in the National Guard a few years ago. And I asked the attendee that whether we could have a glucometer to every diabetic patient in Saudi Arabia. And the majority, they are right. They said, Dr. Abdurrahman, this is not possible, only people on insulin. But when we finished that discussion, all of them got convinced. Everybody in Saudi Arabia could have a diabetic who could have a glucometer, even a pre-diabetic. So they were surprised the way I said it. And I told them, okay, I brought from my center that time, Khashm Al-An, many years back, that some latest 100 prescription for antibiotic for people coming with upper respiratory viral infections. And we calculated, very interesting session. Yalla, uh, antibiotic, this, 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 that, calculate the money. We discovered that augmentin is 87 real. Zinat is 75 real. And we calculated the money and with these people, they are receiving a lot of unnecessary antibiotics. So I think there should be a reorientation of the way we deliver our care. So that is what I mean by large, and I'm sure you get my point. Is it clear this point, Yajama? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay, okay. Now, because of the importance of this, I will re give many examples, as I told you before, we believe only vaccination and so on, about this primary uh, prevention. Then I will define more and explain more primary prevention, especially in relation to death, because people believe death is the cause of the whole cardiovascular diabetes, hypertension, and so on. So I would give that. Let us see so many examples. I will rush through them about primary prevention, tools available, okay. Active vaccination, healthy foods, regular exercise, avoiding sedentary life, all these are primary Yanyama interventions. Food fortification by iodine, folic acid, water, chlorination, adolescence and school health programs, uh, violence prevention, substance abuse prevention, use of condoms, husband, wife, hepatitis B, and so on, no smoking areas, do not share personal items, seat belts and helmets use, public health, the sewage disposal, hygiene hand washing and hand rub, and we are very aware of, we are in the era of that. Mosquito nets, prophylaxis, pregnancy prevention in people who are sickless, people on teratogenic, some females, how we can prevent, prevent uh, pregnancy so that we do not have a lot of mortality and morbidity. So in other ways, primary prevention again, and because it's important, and death in relation to death, Death is an important cause of many chronic diseases, as we know. So changing behavior has the potential to decrease the burden of many of the, our chronic diseases. 
So improve, improving cardiovascular outcomes in healthy people without existing cardiovascular disease or elevated risk factor, this is primary prevention. Again, small changes in lifestyle have profound effect on the risk of CVD or cardiovascular diseases over decades. So this is very important statement. Again, to revisit secondary prevention, systematic application of a test or inquiry to identify those who are at a sufficient risk of a specific disorder to benefit from further investigations. Or we direct our preventive action among those who do, have not sought medical attention. We look for them at home. We go and look for them at home on account of symptom of problem that which is asymptomatic. So you know, we know screening and you know it in many ways. So we should be able to define and we talked about all the parameters I mentioned them. Now, having said that, we need to see if we want to achieve our objective. What do we need? So how will we achieve our aim? To me, I believe, although we all hope to prevent any disease from occurring at all, but I think this is uh, yani a remote aspiration for many reasons. We don't have the biological, clinical, or epidemiological data which is needed for implementing an effective or prevent any pre effective preventive program. In other words, we need an evidence-based information about any primary prevention we do, any secondary activities we do, and even any tertiary activity we do. But I always, as I always tell people, evidence is not always there, and evidence may be there and it may not be rigorous. So that is what we think. But I want somebody to give a statement, how can we achieve our aim? And our aim, I will repeat again, is to eliminate ailments and diseases from our society. Have them coming just for what we call well man clinic, well baby clinic, well woman clinic. How will we achieve this? Anybody can contribute? How do we hope to prevent diseases? How do we put it together? Do health promotion. Anybody? So somebody is inside, for example, perimarital screening test, excellent. This is very important. So we use reliable tests, I agree with you. So how will we go through our objectives? Anybody? Okay, now because of the time, I looked at the watch now. Now, what I'm going to present in the next 10 to 12 slides is I went through what we call the British Medical Journal Clinical Evidence References. And this is one of some of the or few journals of evidence base which I received. Unfortunately for me, I got surprising results regarding cardiovascular diseases. What is the evidence base primary prevention we are using? And what is the secondary base, evidence based procedures? And this is what I'm going to through it. There are so many, we don't need to cram anything, it should be in the clinic. So this is what I'm going to do. This is the main bulk of my presentation, having laid the ground for that. Again, I'm repeating, I'm going to present to you an information from the clinical evidence. Not only that, it is a BMJ series where we receive this. And this is the cardiovascular prevention program, clinical evidence. Okay. So these people mentioned primary prevention, for example, of cardiovascular disease. Use of the dead. They said likely to be beneficial, and this is how the evidence is presented, likely to be beneficial to reduce the cardiovascular diseases, advised to reduce sodium intake because it has an effect on the blood pressure. But there is no evidence-based data in reduction of mortality. Unknown effectiveness is to give advice for this in isolation. For example, increasing fiber intake to your patients only this advice, not in combination with the remaining two, for example, increasing fruits and vegetables alone or reducing fat intake alone. So if you don't combine them together, they will be of unknown effectiveness, according to the recent evidence. What of cholesterol lowering interventions are low risk people of coronary heart diseases? Likely to be beneficial if they have cholesterol intervention lowering in, as a primary prevention, by the way, Statins in those at low risk likely to be beneficial. 
but of unknown effectiveness in low risk is using ezetimibe, fibrates, niacin, and resins. This has no known effectiveness at all. Again, what of the medium risk? Beneficial fibrates. I was really surprised when I got this material. Likely to be beneficial statins in this group. Unknown effectiveness, again, ezetimibe, niacin, and resins. And we are going to rotate around these five things. Now, what of the high risk? High risk primary prevention, cholesterol lowering intervention in people at high risk of coronary heart disease, beneficial statins. Unknown effectiveness, now the fibrates came up here with these four groups. Likely to be beneficial is to reduce or modify the fat diet in a patient, especially in low, medium, and even high risk. So this is for all of them is likely to be beneficial if you modify the diet. What of the primary prevention when you treat hypertension? Likely to be the beneficial is to use fish oil and low salt diet. Unknown effectiveness to tell them calcium and magnesium supplementation. What of unknown effectiveness still? Anti-hypertensive drugs in relation to what? No anti-hypertensive drug has been found to be more effective than the others at reducing all-cause mortality, unfortunately, or cardiovascular disease mortality or myocardial infarction. Diuretics may be more effective than AC inhibitors and calcium channel blockers at reducing heart failure. And you can see converting enzyme inhibitors may be more effective than calcium channel blockers for prevention of coronary heart diseases. So this is the primary prevention for cardiovascular disease. Still, what of the physical activity? Likely to be beneficial is to increase the physical activity will lead to the increased physical activity in healthy people without existing cardiovascular disease. So counseling people to increase physical activity or to perform higher versus lower intensity exercise program is likely to be beneficial. Unknown effectiveness in relation to cardiovascular outcomes in healthy people without existing CVD. So they are saying there is no, un, yeah, there is no effectiveness if you do that. And this is the statement, of, I'm just copying it. Now, what of secondary prevention of ischemic cardiac events? I'm going to discuss the cardiac and CVA mainly. So long-term treatment to prevent recurrent cardiac morbidity and mortality, that's what I mean by secondary prevention in relation to ischemic cardiac diseases in people who have had either a prior MI or acute coronary syndrome, or who are at a high risk due to severe coronary artery stenosis or prior coronary surgery. So what is the secondary prevention? Beneficial aspirin, Blavex, which is clopidogrel and aspirin. Likely to be beneficial, well, they're talking of clopidogrel, ticoplidine, and prasagril. Likely to be ineffective or even harmful is to give any of this uh, glycoprotein 2B, 3A receptor inhibitors, apixaban and tyrubifan and so on. What is still secondary prevention of ischemic cardiac events? Other drugs may be beneficial, AC inhibitors, amiodarone, and, and you can see receptor blockers and beta blockers. I told you this is a big list. I'm just going through it. Secondary prevention of ischemic cardiac events, unknown effectiveness, combination of AC inhibitors, and, and you can see receptor blockers, and this is, is not allowed by all means likely to be ineffective or harmful to give calcium channel blocker for secondary prevention of ischemic events, quinidine, prokinamide, or hormone replacement therapy. What of the effects of cholesterol reduction for secondary prevention of ischemic cardiac events? Beneficial, non-specific cholesterol reduction, whatever you do, or you give statin. Likely to be, benefic to be beneficial is to use fibrate. So what are the effects of blood pressure reduction for secondary prevention of ischemic events? Beneficial, definitely blood pressure reduction. So what are the effects of non-drug treatment for secondary prevention? Again, beneficial, you do cardiac rehabilitation, and it includes exercise, smoking, and so on. Likely to be beneficial, advice to eat Mediterranean food, for example. Increase fish oil, either in capsules, like we use now, or psychological stress management and reduction, smoking cessation, and so on. This is likely to be beneficial as secondary prevention of ischemic events. What are the effects of non-drug treatment for secondary prevention of ischemic cardiac events? Unknown effectiveness is to advise to eat less fat or advise to eat more fiber, but unlikely to be beneficial antioxidant, and we are using it, unfortunately. Vitamin combinations, multivitamins, vitamin C as an antioxidant, 
likely to be ineffective or harmless beta carotene and vitamin E. And I can tell you from my experience, many patients come to ask for vitamin E as an antioxidant. So it's not useful in these categories. This is evidence, Ya Jama'a. طيب, what of stroke? How will we do secondary prevention for a stroke in people who have previous stroke? Beneficial aspirin combined with dipyridomol, antiplatelet treatment, Plavix, blood pressure reduction, cholesterol reduction. We do that, fortunately. Unlikely to be beneficial, high dose versus low dose aspirin. There is no benefit, 351 or 81 or 100 milligram. So no additional benefit and may increase harm. So low dose is advised. Vitamin B supplements. Likely to be ineffective or harmful to use anticoagulation in any form. What of the effects of preventive anticoagulant in those even without previous stroke? Beneficial oral anticoagulant. Unlikely to be beneficial antiplatelet and aspirin. The same list comes here. What are the effects of preventive anticoagulant and antiplatelet in people with atrial fibrillation and previous stroke or transient ischemic attack? Beneficial oral anticoagulant and non effectiveness as aspirin. Now, having overloaded you with this new evidence, I want to criticize the evidence, clinical evidence, as an evidence-based teacher for years. Clinical evidence, it has some limitation. Please always remember, the evidence is not enough alone. You need your experience, experiential learning, and you need the patient values and expectation. That is why most of these papers, if you go through, through them, even the GNC8 evidence, a lot of confounding factors were difficult. Even they acknowledge it's difficult by the researchers to adjust for. Slow build of atherosclerosis, very difficult studies done on cardiovascular diseases. Risk factors, they will always look for risk factors and not disease outcome. And what we mean by disease outcome is mortality and morbidity. Again, diet control more lower the risk of cardiovascular disease by exerting favorable changes like on body mass index, on the diabetes, on uh, blood pressure or lipids. We know that this is really happening. Again, dead, dead, dead. But before I move to my last three, four slides and conclude, I cannot pass prevention, again, primary of cancers, of uh, increasing body weight and of accident. And this is what I'm going to discuss about lifestyle, healthy lifestyle counsel. Again, reminding all of us at the conclusion, heart diseases, malignancies, coronary respiratory diseases, stroke, accident, metabolic diseases, this is the most common causes of this. Again, cardiovascular is number one. So we aim at preventing these most causes of this. Healthy lifestyle, primary prevention of cancers, very long list, I'm just summarizing it. Avoiding ultraviolet radiation, appropriate sunscreen use, avoiding alcohol and smoking, choose food wisely, achieving and maintaining body weight. And the last number five, it, it is implicated in most of the malignancies, unfortunately. So this is, there are many depending on the cancer. For example, each cancer, breast, uh, colon has its own risk factors, but this is by large. So what of the accidents? Routine use of seat belt, we know, and helmet for motorcycle, smoke detectors, weapon safety, uh, heaters at home, general public education and the parents for kids improving by cycle lanes and what people who do exercises, home safety measures and so on. This is just to sensitize you. Remember, accidents are common cause of morbidity and mortality. Lastly, but not the least, is the increased weight. Eliminate, how do you do primary prevention for obesity? Eliminating sugar containing beverages, implementing reduced calorie diet, avoiding processed food, practicing uh, mindful eating, and we know that, physical exercise, avoiding sedentary life. So this is by large. I know you know most of these things, but we bring it together, we remind each of us because they are important. Again, the whole story about lifestyle is as a primary prevention. Sleep hygiene, stress reduction, taxation and pricing, food stamp programs, making healthy choices as the default option, promote purchase of fruits and vegetables and inhibit the purchase of NLC foods. Before I conclude, I just want quickly to rush through involving our patient, decision making. So what is a shared decision making program? Because all what I have said, if our patient do not agree to it, is a failed program, and I always bring the patient at the center of any activity we do. 
So patient decision aid or support tools they are talking about now are the most modern things, are means of helping people to make informed choices about healthcare, treatment, screening, that take into account their personal values and preferences. And this is the parcel and heart of evidence-based medicine. They bring high quality information and informed discussion about treatment options and screening tools. A Cochrane review provide, and I'm going to give you the evidence from Cochrane very soon about the evidence and benefit of these tools. So take home messages. No decision aid, this is my own statement, please. No decision aid can replace the power of consultation skills, counseling skills, and conversation with our patients. Please, this is my message to you. Patients should have their autonomy when they discuss with their clinicians such an important decision regarding vaccination to themselves, to their relatives, to their kids, screening, and so on, and rehabilitation. The issue of COVID-19 is known to everybody, the vaccine, I mean. So decision aid modeling is a shared medical decision making process where a patient, their relative, their provided discuss the most risk versus benefit of any activity we do or any different care action we provide. Patients should be given the opportunity to reveal their preferences, their health beliefs, their feelings, their worries, their expectation jointly to make any decision. This is a growing expectation and a strong decision-making tool that is gaining momentum in the modern clinical practice era. So this is by large. So what is the last statement I want to see? One or two statements. Recent evidence has reviewed, has shown that these decision-making tools has facilitated significant increases in knowledge. This is Cochrane. The computer-based information tool, the decision analysis tools, individualized and group counseling interventions has significant effect in reducing anxiety level. Again, evidence-based. The computer-based computer information tool and the decision analysis tools were associated with reduction in the level of decisional conflict. When you inform your patients well, when you give them chance to balance the risk versus benefit, there will be no conflict in the discussion. These tools can assist healthcare professionals to provide up-to-date information and counseling about the different choices regarding the screening for these chronic diseases. But what of what we are doing today in Saudi Arabia? To achieve these goals of health promotion, we must know about certain diseases common in our society. This is number one, their risk factors and symptoms. I told you is a multi-agent. The importance of all stakeholders' efforts cannot be overemphasized. So it's not only the physicians, it's not the nurses, it's not the leaders. It is everybody coming together. It is necessary to remember that most healthcare professionals are more interested in treatment than in prevention, unfortunately. This is maybe due to the fact that the demand for clinical care is high. Also, they receive financial benefit for treatment from the, our consumers, all the private clinic, including most of our what is going on in the Ministry of Health. So there is no such benefit for preventive care. So what I mean by here is there must be incentive, like in UK, for screening, prevention, and so on. All kind of things, providing, for example, osteoporosis screening to our elderly. So there must be some incentives for the prevention also. Now, this is a thought for all of you. Just to think about it, and I'm, I've finished. What has happened, this is my own conclusion. What has happened to our chronic diseases, patients during the COVID-19 pandemic? I know the time. Was virtual clinic provided the required health care to our patients? All the medical and personal behaviors and health was focused on COVID-19 and not on any other ailment for the last two years. Was that ethical? And I, now I leave the floor for you to comment. Thank you very much. This is all what I have. Uh, Thank you so much, Mbrisa, uh, Doctor. Thank you so much, and Very difficult questions to be answered. Uh, Let's Dr. hear from all of you to answer. Yalla, for all of you to answer, our seniors and juniors, to answer my three questions I framed this morning. I know it's time for prayer, but uh, some of us has to wait for a few minutes to answer these questions or try to answer it. It's difficult, I know. Well, it's very difficult to answer, especially that it's the chronic it's for you for reflection. Actually, yeah. I don't want the answer. I'm looking for you to reflect, to think about what is going on in the last two years regarding our 
chronic disease patients. I really pity them, actually. والله أنا نظريتي يا دكتور نصيح إنه اللي ما حيموت في كوفيد إحنا بإذن الله حنموته neglecting his chronic disease. That is the conclusion of these three lines. Thank you very much. We hope with that will not happen, inshallah, ya dikdur. La hawla wa la quwta illa. La masraha. Ana wallahi, lano, these statements reflect a clear responsibility to these three questions. Because I reflected, you know, I have a very long experience. And I've been worried about these patients when everybody, the clinics closed and so on. Everybody's running away from healthcare centers and so on. So I said, look, what is these people? What is their hemoglobin A1C during these days? What is their visual equity now going on? What is their weight? What is happening? So all things, we forgot it, and now we are worried about wearing masks, doing this, washing our hands. So I'm just, it's a reflection for you. It's just to make the session live, that's all. And that's what I do always with my residents. I always give you something to reflect on. So it's not cramming, it's not pouring information. You can get it anywhere, but it is this discussion I like. So I wish, yeah, this session was useful to all of you or added something to you. And I thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. If there is any questions or comments before we close Please, the floor, I know it's break time. I if yeah. I don't know the question, I will tell you I don't know it. So you don't, you didn't see me, so you will not meet me on the road and ask me. <laughs> Victor, we'll catch you anywhere now. It's very, it's very easy by the technology. Uh, anyway, if there is any comments uh, from the audience, uh, mm. uh, floor is open. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Feedback. Anybody, please, I want to raise your voice. We listen to you. I will be happy. Are you hearing me, Dr. Abdurrahman? Dr. Abdurrahman, thank you for your help. And definitely, if we work hard in preventing the disease to happen, uh, things will be better. Uh, and as you said, now the chronic disease is more. And after post-COVID, we are seeing all the consequences of uh, uh, having the patient long time away from the practice and the patient who got COVID, and they have uh, a long COVID uh, consequences and uh, this is يعني صراحة العالم الآن عنده ضريبة والمضاعفات الكوفيد is everywhere either from COVID or the consequences of ignoring the patient in the COVID time uh, and we are facing this reality we need to go up and catch our patients and try to uh, either try to help them and try to catch them where they are and this is so difficult uh, but we need to think about it. Uh, let's see if there is any other. Uh, please remember, I know there is. I prepared actually 20 questions and I sent eight questions, and one of them was chosen. I'm very happy. This is a question I wanted to be chosen. So I'm getting the answers. So we know the answer very soon. I will read it. Dr. Abdurrahman, yes? I have put up all eight questions. Ah, okay. Upload and let us see the answers. I'm ready. I'm waiting. No problem. Okay, we're going to launch them one by one. Um, so I'm just giving everybody some time so that only six people have answered so far. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Poll closed now. If yeah, you can we'll share this with question, I think the time is enough for it now. So now we'll stop sharing and let us see. So this man who doesn't have the time and so on, we know the answer is correct. Uh, can I answer? Yes, perceive barriers to action. Actually, this is the answer. Let us see the next question just because of the time. Next question. Okay. Okay, so which of the following reflect the pre-contemplation? It's a long question, but just read it quickly and start answering. So what is the pre-contemplation? We know there is pre-contemplation, contemplation, and so on, maintenance, and so on. Smoking mainly.
Is everybody able to see the poll? So, I'm waiting for the answer. Mm. So what is the pre-contemplation? I don't worry about my cholesterol syndrome anymore. It has been, how oh, this, are getting this. Pre-contemplation. Yeah, and you have not reached the stage of contemplation of even putting it in your mind. Okay, okay, excellent. Ah, now it's coming in. Okay, the time I think is enough for it, this question. Dr. Nasir, all the seven questions are here. So we're going to give them a few more minutes to answer. Okay, all. okay, okay. I don't know when this the session finishes in one hour or we can... It finishes at 8.15. Ah, 8.15, خلاص. Now we have time. Very good. So I want to give each question almost about two minutes. Okay, so now... And All the questions, then we rush through them again. Well, uh, I don't know. You want it one by one? It's up to you, doctor. Both ways are good. Okay, I don't know. I think they finish everything so that then we finish it together. Okay. So that we link the thinking and everything. There will be no break when we are discussing the answers. Okay. Well, let's give them about maybe nine to ten minutes, eight minutes, or five minutes, five to six minutes. Give them the questions. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Liel.
Doctor, would you like to, me to end the poll? Start now because the remaining eight minutes, we should make use of it. Okay. So, okay. You can start putting the questions. We finished number one. So we are on the second one, which is the pre contemplation. Now, uh, many answered this. I don't think I can change my cholesterol and so on. But uh, the answer, unfortunately, from the reference who brought the question, epidemiology, that it is number B. I think I will join fitness club next month because exercise is going to reduce my risk. So it's pre is is actually the functional or cognitive form of thinking about changing behavior. So the answer is B. So next question, we hope in the future we meet and we discuss more. Yalla, next question. So which of the next question, which of the following uh, statements reflect the maintenance stage of the behavior change model? So the answers here I can see, mashallah, the majority I am learning more about low fat substitutions and I'm trying them with my favorite recipes and so on. Now, uh, okay. Hello? Hello? is majority almost answered the right answer, which is number D, uh, 43, is the D, and that is, uh, I make low fat choices when I eat at home. So this is the answer for this question, Ajama. Again, the answer is D. The next question, I think it is the nurse, yeah. The nurse educator is planning a smoking cessation program. Understand that most basic types of health promotion program is, so what is the answer, our answers here? Majority answers, uh, providing counseling for lifestyle, 57, okay, 43. Yeah, the nurse, this one. I don't know, maybe it's changing the program. So the, the, I will read again. The nurse educator is planning smoking cessation. This is question number four. So the answer is A, utilizing a variety of uh, media information and dissemination. I mean media information for dissemination or information dissemination. So the next question, just because of the time, and this is the quick questions. So, this is a quick uh, form of questions here now. So, uh, is it this one? The public health? Oh, yeah, the public health nurse. Yeah, the public nurse. Uh, who does? Oh, yeah, excellent. Does blood pressure screening a related health education is conducting activities of? We know that. All answered 64. This is secondary prevention because pre symptomatic detection. Anything has to do with hypertension is secondary. Is Screening, excellent. Next, the health education who teaches proper body mechanics, bending and lifting, conducting activities of primary prevention. We know, excellent, excellent, 97%. The clinic nurse who is uh, claims multiple sclerosis, support group providers, information about community resources and counseling, and this is tertiary, very clear. Complications, excellent. The last question. Yeah, a home nurse who provide care and uh, repositioning to a client. We said this is tertiary prevention. Ah, okay. A uh, client on bed rest is conducting, uh, uh, again, a home health nurse who provides skin care. Come on, this is uh, tertiary. A repositioning of that elderly maybe person on bed rest is conducting activities. Is it health promotion, health protection, or health prevention, or rehabilitation? The answer is health protection. So this is... Uh, how many they got it? Uh, 14%. But this is the answers from the reference I got. So are you hearing me? People who are still around, they have not gone for prayer. 
Yes, yes, we are. Yeah, so I any question, and I hope I hope really this session is useful. Any comment, Dr. Tazim? Anybody? Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rahman. It's a nice presentation. Thank you very much. What we, it's a, uh, your voice, I cannot hear it, yeah, Dr. Tazim. Yes, it is. Now you can hear me. Can you? Hello? Hello? Okay. Hello? I, yeah, Hello? can you go ahead? Overall, it was a very uh, nice presentation. Well, I think that I'm unfortunate. I cannot hear you very far. Why? Maybe my computer. One minute. Actually, I can't hear him either, Dr. Abdurrahman. Yeah, because now I hear you very well. You are hearing me? Yeah, now I think it's reasonable. Go ahead, Dr. Tazim. Uh, so it's a nice presentation, Dr. Abdurrahman. You covered from health promotion, primary, secondary, tertiary. Uh, well, the is not clear. Sensitivity, specificity, uh, positive. Like, Azim, unfortunately, unless you write it, we cannot hear you at all. Okay, thank you. So it's uh, we will talk together tomorrow. Yeah. Very nice. Good luck. Uh, shukran, doctor. Thank you so much. It was yeah, very really informative. All of you for your contribution too. And it's, I'm very happy with an interactive group. And really, I hope it will be useful to help us to help our patients in the future. Hopefully, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank Adil. you so much, and uh, looking forward to hear from you, from you again in another uh, session. Inshallah. And thanks for our audience all, and thanks for Fiki for arrangement. And uh, see you soon in another Fiki. The last comments Thank from you, Dr. Your side. I really enjoyed this session. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This was a very engaging uh, and stimulating uh, session. Thank you. Right. Thank you all. And I thank you, Vicky. You really tried with me. I've been reminding me, which is very good. Thank you very much for you and for all of you. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. See you, inshallah. You too. Thank you thank so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.